All right, uh, would you state your name, sir? Timothy Talley. All right, and uh, the reason you're here right now, you're not going to testify, uh, testify yet, uh, if you testify, <coughs> but uh, <coughs> Uh, earlier on in the proceedings, and I don't know if this was uh, you were made aware of this or not, but there was a request uh, by one of the parties to obtain your psychiatric uh, history with Dr. Uh, I think it's Callahan, isn't it? Yes. And uh, records of your psychiatric uh, consultations and treatment with him. And um, and uh, there are circumstances in which that ca there's two things that can happen. One of them is that, well, three things can happen. One is that it'll not be disclosed, which is the ordinary course of things when people are treating with a physician or psychologist or psychiatrist. Or secondly, uh, it may be disclosed to the court, to me, so that I can review it to determine whether there would be anything in there that um, would tend to assist the defense in showing that uh, innocence, uh, that, that isn't really the test, but that I'm going to put it in those terms. Uh, or third, that you, it may be made available as, a, as uh, just to anyone in, in the case and ultimately in the public record. Um, and that would apply if the court were to find that you had voluntarily waived the privilege respecting that. Did you uh, ever get notice from anyone about this? Uh, These issues being before the court? Yes, I believe so. Okay, did you uh, want to say anything on this subject as to whether or not uh, the court should follow any of those particular approaches? I have no problem. With any of those uh, things no. happening? All right, anybody want to ask him any questions? No, Your Honor. No, I, I presume the court's going to find I, and I had already indicated a bias towards finding a waiver based upon his petition that he filed with Judge, I think it's Mel Soskis. Um, and I will follow through on that, especially in light of his comments, and they'll be made available to you. Then no questions. All right. And did you have any other questions, sir? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. Good day. They can look at them. I'm going to put it that way. Um, all right. Anything else today? Um, Your Honor, I need a short recess to discuss something with co-counsel. She just was in consultation with the Attorney General's office, and she, the, she's telling me there's something that I should take up with you and Mr. Albee tonight. So, but I have no idea what it is. So, I'd like to talk with her to see whether this is something that has to be done tonight. So, could I have a few minutes with her? Um, Wisconsin Practice, Wisconsin Evidence by Daniel Blinka. It reads, in criminal cases, the prosecution may offer any statements made by the defendant. For the most part, however, party admissions are a one-way street in a criminal litigation. Statements made by prosecutors or government investigators are not ordinarily admissible against the prosecution as admissions. The courts have, however, recognized the defense right to make limited use of this, of this exemption in unique cases. And, they, and he cites to footnote 10, footnote 10, the Wisconsin Supreme Court has now adopted guidelines controlling when a prior statement made by a prosecutor is admissible into evidence in a criminal proceeding. In State versus Cardenas Hernandez, the court held that admissions by prosecutors... Sub the site? Oh. Uh, 219 West 2nd, 516, 1998. 516? Yes, Your Honor. The court held that admissions by prosecutors is subject to a three-part test that was first formulated for determining when defense, counsel's, when defense counsel statements could be used against the defendant. First, the circuit court must be satisfied that the prior statement is an assertion of fact that is inconsistent with the assertion at a later trial. The inconsistency in the statements must be, quote, clear and of a quality which obviates any need for the trier of fact to explore other events at the prior trial. Second, the circuit court must determine that the statements of the counsel are the equivalent of testimonial statements by the defendant. 
there must be something beyond the attorney-client relationship to show participation by the defendant. Third, the trial court must, in a hearing outside the jury, quote, determine by a preponderance of the evidence that the inference the prosecution seeks to draw from the inconsistency is a fair one and that an innocent explanation does not exist. If opposing inferences are of equal weight or the preponderance of the evidence favors the innocent explanation, the prior statement should be excluded. Um, thus, the circuit court should apply these three factors to statements made by prosecutors in prior proceedings. The Supreme Court flatly rejected a per se prohibition on the use of prior statements by prosecutors fearing quote, abuse and sharp practices, unquote, that could weaken the public's confidence in the justice system. The three restrictions quoted above are intended, however, quote, to avoid the possible collateral consequences that could result from an unbridled use of such statements. In this case, the Supreme Court held that the prosecutor's earlier statements failed the first guideline. All the prosecutor's statements were, quote, factual assertions, unquote, those statements were not. What are the three guidelines again? The three, um, let's see. First, the circuit court must be satisfied that the prior statement is an assertion of fact that is inconsistent with the assertion at a later trial. Well, that would be true here, no? Well, except that it wasn't at a previous trial, Your Honor. It was a letter. Well, I am, yeah, but I think counsel, that they're inconsistent. The, the, uh, the test is actually taken from uh, uh, rules applicable to a defendant. I, I would concede, Your Honor, that m the earlier statement that I made in my letter to Mr. Albee is inconsistent with what the state, uh, with what the witness has testified to, and is inconsistent with the state's assertion at this trial. Okay, Nick. Then. Um, <laughs> Well, anyway, that was where in the state versus Cardenas Hernandez, that's where it ended. Now, the second standard then is the circuit court must determine that the statements of the counsel are equivalent of testimonial statements by the defendant. There must be something beyond the attorney-client relationship to show participation by the defendant. Well, it, it just strikes me here, you know, I, as you were going through the test, it, it just strikes me that uh, what I said before, it, it, it holds true that it seems to me that Mr. Albee has the right to argue to the jury that this there's a circumstantial case tending to show that Dr. Long gave some faulty information, um, which would tend to uh, raise doubts about the accuracy of uh, some of his reports in the case. Well, Your Honor, let's look at the third stage, the third standard. Um, third, the trial court must, in a hearing outside the jury, determine by preponderance of the evidence that the inference the prosecution seeks to draw, in this case the defense seeks to draw from the inconsistency, is a fair one, and that an innocent explanation does not exist. If the opposing inferences are of equal weight, or the preponderance of evidence favors the innocent explanation, the prior statement should be excluded. Now, there's not been that hearing because I've not testified, and uh, maybe I'm missing the point. It strikes me that this isn't a question of an innocent explanation or anything. This is a suggestion that there exists various circumstances consisting of your letter and of Dr. Lavin's testimony at preliminary examination. There are circumstances which would might suggest to the jury, and I'm not saying that I conclude this or that I believe this but that the defense would be entitled to argue to the jury that the circumstances suggest that perhaps Dr. Long was a little careless in things that were stated to people. That, and that strikes me that that would meet all three tests. But you can think about it overnight. Or that the prosecutor was careless in statements that he Except made. Except that Dr. Levin is in the picture too. Well, and you know, that's true, that's true. So, I, I, and the reason I'm talking about it now, and I am kind of forcing the issue now, because as I, I complained yesterday about our having these long delays before we get started in the morning all the time. So I'd like to resolve these issues as close as possible, as fast as possible. So I'm gonna give you a, a, a very brief time to respond uh, for the record, and, and also to buttress uh, your argument on it. Um, and then I'll leave overnight for you to think about it further, and if you could think of some compelling reason why I'm wrong, then I'll, 
uh, change my preliminary ruling that the letter would be admissible as a statement against interest. Thank you. The, the case cited by Mr. Chamboy is Card Cardenas Hernandez. Um, I think also has language in paragraph 16, 219 with second at 528. It says the jury is at least entitled to know that the government at one time believed and stated that its proof established something different from what it currently claims. I think that's applicable. But more importantly, this case is, is, comes up in a different circumstance, I think, than the cases like Card Cardenas Hernandez in that one, this is a 971-23 statement. It was specifically intended to summarize what the experts would say. And it creates an expectation on the part of the defendant, I think a very reasonable one. And I had my experts respond to that. Uh, second, it is a prior inconsistent statement of, of, Dr., of Dr. Long's. I think it can be attributed to, to him. In the same way that if this was Detective Ratsburg that said, Dr. Dr. Long says, says X. Because oh, you mean it's the way that it would be? Okay, okay, go ahead. I mean, it's a representation of what Dr. Okay, Long go ahead. was saying, right? And so, I would be entitled to put that put that in, and and I also I think it's just it's the right to present a defense for many of the reasons suggested by the by the court in terms of me being able to argue to the jury to draw that inference, especially with him, with two different witnesses reporting that Dr. Long is uh, indicated that the basically a belly full of ethylene glycol versus a half a teaspoon. I mean, this is a, ma this is a major issue in this, in this case. And I also have to say that every single person I ever had read this report also reaches those kind of conclusions. I, I mean, I think the report itself is, con it's Dr. Lavin, it's the report itself, and then Dr. Uh, Dr. Chamboise's letter. Well, I don't agree with your first round. I, I, uh, and I'm not going to get an extensive discussion about what I think about the pre rehearsed trials, uh, because I think you had fair notice of the change in the state's approach. Uh, the second ground I do agree with, the second ground I do agree with, that this is a substitute. Literally, it's a substitute for calling Mr. Jamboys as a witness, which you can't um, realistically do in this case. And so, uh, and I won't even come in on the third. So I, I, my preliminary ruling is that the later letter could be presented as a statement against interest by the government. So that's issue number one. Now the other one I think that we had dangling was uh, the uh, uh, associates of Dr. Long. And uh, has that been resolved? Well, here's what I had would, would propose, Your Honor. Um, I believe we could make those witnesses available via telephone. <laughs> Um, and if counsel wants us to produce them at their expense, we'd be willing to do that. But the case law, I think, is pretty clear that we're not obligated to produce those witnesses, that Dr. Long can testify uh, so long as these are matters that he normally rely upon in support of his opinion, and he can testify in these matters without us producing those analysts. But I know we're in this decision that you handed me, which is state against... Um... Stanford, I think it was. Mm. Stanford. Barton, what a lousy man. Barton. See how unreliable I am, Your Honor? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, now, I, I have to say, I've only read it a uh, cursory reading once. Nowhere did I find the word, well, I take it back, that is in there, in a quotation from the North Carolina. Well, there's also- from California, from California. It does use the word testimonial. Uh, but I'll tell you what, when there are questions, as there have been raised in this case about the actual handling of evidence because the defense contends or has introduced evidence to the effect that there, there's, there's no account in the record at this moment in time about the dispatch of this material from Wisconsin. And there's also, I think it was stated that there was nothing in terms of the receipt documents in... Um, Actually, there is. Yeah, in St. Louis, did I miss something? That's not true. The, the fact is that it is received. Uh, and there's a, there's a note on uh, page 20 of Exhibit S119 indicating that they received the cast of contents. What's missing, Judge, is the sender does not check cast of contents. And um, they're not saying they sent it, but the, rece the receiver is saying they received it. 
So they received the gastric contents at the St. Louis Forensic Lab. That's according to the receipt that uh, is on um, is page 20 of Exhibit S119. Um, so uh, what we're willing to do, and as a, as a compromise, in the spirit of compromise, is make these. Well, I don't want to get into compromise because I. I'm not going to preside over deciding that someone should have a compromise shoved down his throat, whether it's him or you. Uh, I will, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to this. I, I want to take some more time. Well, in wanna, when you're looking you at, to, pardon me? when you're looking at chain of custody issues, Your Honor, um, well, there was a case I hit. Is this the case? That, uh, there, there is, I cite to the court the case of State of Wisconsin versus William McCoy. Um, opinion was filed December 27th, 2006. Uh, it's uh, 298 with second, 523. And um, the headnote three is the law with respect to chain of custody cases issues requires proof sufficient to render it improbable that the original item had been exchanged, contaminated, or tampered with. That's the standard. And um, anyway, I'd request the court look at that case. I, I, I think that my recollection is that is the standard, but we have, a, we have a problem with that in this case where we don't have any evidence that it was collected for testing, and then we have a new problem that doesn't appear to have been to have been sent, but I mean the, the really big problem is how do we know these things were collected and stored and saved? Where did they come from? Well, your alleged gaps in a chain of custody go to the weight of the evidence rather than its admissibility, as I said earlier, and now in a more authoritative source, as the Court of Appeals says in State versus Walter William McCoy. 298 with second 523 at it would appear to be page 526. And do you have any authority of the contrary? Well, I, I think <clears throat> I'll, have to, I'll have to look at it, Judge, but it, there, it, there has to be some chain of custody. I, I mean, there, there, it just, it just can't be people claiming that this exists and that this is what it is. There has to be, there has to be something there, and starters, it has to exist and, 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 to be transferred. I had a burglary case once where the victim uh, looked at seven pennies and was able to identify them as having been taken from his home. Now I don't know how because there was nothing unique about them. But that is the problem. There does need to be some basis for me to let the jury decide. But it may be that the receipt of gastric contents, along with other things attributed to the decedent, might be sufficient. We'll have to, we'll have to talk about it more. I think, I think there has to be the person who set that in, in motion. I don't know that I would name anyone as being an indispensable person. I would. <laughs> Why do I think that? Uh, all right, well, we'll take a look at it. Um, and I would say that uh, I think, as a, is clear, my bias would be given, I, I thought that Dr. had testified there was no evidence of its receipt, but apparently there is in here. So uh, Dr. didn't testify to that. I, 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 I would swear I heard. No evidence of his receipt. No, he said there, there was no, he was looking at the document that was sent. The document, the document of, the, of the sender. Right. He, was, he was testifying about that. He was asked about that. He was not asked about page right. 20. Obviously, I mis misunderstood the testimony, so. All right, um, anything else? No. Okay, see you uh, tomorrow.